What's up, gangsters? It is a gross and chilly day out here in the middle of nowhere at Rube Goldberg Enterprises, but it is still one of my favorite kind of days because it's a day where I have finished a project. <laughs> and that always feels good. That's always a good day, no matter what the weather is like, uh, especially when it's has been as long as it's been since you've had a completion. Uh, and it's been a while for me. Um, I think about six months. The last thing I think I finished was my Heller 124th uh, Ferguson tractor. And then I just found myself uh, in a, a phase where I started a bunch of new projects all at the same time. Well, not a bunch. Uh, it was really only two. But then I added a third one. And uh, it was supposed to be all about just fun and exploration and growing my skills. <laughs> yeah, um, famous last words. Anyway, I have finally finished that project. Um, and it, uh, huh, wow, what an adventure it's been. Anyway, you're like, shut the hell up and tell us what the project was already. Uh, this is the uh, Industria Mechanica 1 6th scale Cosmonaut number 2. Now, if you're immediately not familiar with that, it's no surprise. Industria Mechanica is a pretty small specialty model kit company. Um, they do resin kits uh, that come from mostly, uh, I guess, fair to say, science fiction uh, subjects. Um, not necessarily uh, from any particular storyline or anything like that. These are all, uh, their stuff is all based on original works by various artists. And this one in particular comes from an artist named uh, Derek Stinning, who is a super talented artist and painter from uh, Vancouver. And um, he has done a, a series of paintings that... Uh, inspired uh, this particular kit. Actually, what Industria Mechanica did was they uh, contracted with a really good 3D sculptor to, uh, to actually turn three of Derek's paintings into kits. Uh, well, actually, there's more than that. There's three cosmonauts. There's cosmonaut one, two, and three. And then there's another one uh, that's called dystopic, which is another one of the cosmonauts. But uh, not, one, not, not one of that original series of three. And then there's a new one coming out. But anyway, I'm starting to ramble. What I think is the best way to kind of give you an idea of what Derek Stinning's work is all about um, is to show you this book that I got that he published that is basically a compendium of all of the uh, stuff that he did with this project. So, without further jaw flapping, let me just flip over here and show you a little bit before we look at the kit. Okay, so here's the book. And I got this on Amazon. I don't remember how much it was, but uh, as you can see, it's pretty large, uh, pretty large format, and it's uh, really a high quality piece. And I'm not gonna attempt to go through the whole thing page by page. Um, if you're interested in this guy's stuff, you should just get it yourself and check it out. But. I will give you kind of the basics of what this project was all about. Um, you can see that it's called the EK series. And what EK stands for, and I hope that I'll pronounce this correctly, is Intartet Kunst, which is a German phrase that apparently means degenerate art. And this whole thing, to do my best to hopefully paraphrase um, the, the uh, I guess, uh, aesthetic and the symbology and the inspiration for it, is that this all comes from uh, a period of time in Nazi Germany right before World War II, um, where there were a group of artists, a lot of whom were Jewish, who were producing artwork that uh, the German government and the Nazi party in particular viewed as being degenerate. And they attempted to shut it down and 
uh, basically uh, make it where uh, this type of art and these artists were basically um, marginalized. Anyway, um, Derek Stinning took the aesthetic of some of that art and kind of the historical perspective and basically just started doing a series of paintings that stemmed from, <laughs> as he puts it, some kind of visions that he had in his head. And you can kind of see from some of these pictures uh, kind of what the aesthetic is and what some of the common themes are. It's got a very kind of a dystopian kind of steampunk look to it. And there's a lot of common visual elements. Um, you may notice the, the red star. Um, he said that that's not explicitly uh, Jewish symbology, but it does kind of reflect the history behind the project. There's a lot of these orbs that you'll see floating around uh, in, in, the, in, in the different paintings. And even he says he doesn't really know what they do. They just are there to kind of lend structure and balance to each image. Uh, same thing with um, uh, a lot of them having these uh, big uh, bags or bladders or whatever you want to call them that are attached to their spacesuits, which he says may or may not be some type of breathing apparatus. He doesn't really know, but anyway, this is stuff that's just all common. And he did a lot of this work uh, just for himself and for display in galleries um, and for sale on, on his website. But uh, some of it actually got um, commissioned by a, uh, a snowboard company. I was trying real quick to find the name of the snowboard company. Um, and, uh, it's, oh, it's escaping me. Anyway, uh, pretty cool stuff. And maybe if I, yeah, there you go. You can kind of see what some of the snowboards looked like. And, and again, you can just kind of see the common themes that run throughout the work. Um, this is another one of the cosmonauts. This one has not been made into a kit, but... Uh, let me see if I can find uh, a picture showing the three that were made into kits in the book. You can see how some of these would be pretty challenging to turn into a kit with all of these wires and orbs and things floating around, but you can also see the appeal, I think. It's pretty cool stuff. This one right here is one of the ones that's been turned into a kit. This is the one that's called Dystopic. And the way that I originally found out about this is because if you're familiar with Adam Savage of uh, Discovery Channel Mythbusters fame, he's got a really cool show on YouTube called Tested. And he does all kinds of, of fun things on it, but one of the things he does are his uh, what he calls his one-day builds. And he's got an amazing workshop. I mean, the dude is a formerly um, a model maker at Industrial Light and Magic, so he's got the mad skills already. But he's got the most amazing shop with the just, I mean, it's, it's a fantasy land if you love tools. But anyway, he built one of these dystopic kits on one of his one-day builds. And that's how I originally learned about Industria Mechanica and the whole uh, thing by Derek Stinning. So... Anyway, that's, uh, that's one of the ones that was made into a kit. Let me see here if I can find... I know he's got a page in this book where he shows all three of them together. I think they're talking about making this one into a kit, uh, but don't hold me to that. Okay, here, here's where he starts talking about the model kits. And this is a good illustration of what the actual dystopic kit looks like and how it was built uh, into something that could actually be turned into uh, a viable resin model. And it's huge. I think it's, it's either one-eighth or one-sixth scale. Um, okay, this is... Uh, there you go. There's some more pictures of it. You can see pretty cool stuff. All right, here we go. This page has pictures of all three of the cosmonauts. So you can see cosmonaut number two that I built down here in the lower left. 
and then the other two. And I actually have already bought the Cosmonaut number three kit. We'll give you a little zoomed in view there that you can see. Um, I've got it sitting over here waiting for me to build sometime later this year. So there you go, pretty cool stuff. Anyway, that's about enough of that. I just wanted you guys to get kind of a basic overview of what this is all about because obviously it doesn't fit into any standard genre. Okay, so the first thing you notice when you get something from Industria Mechanica is that it comes in a really nice box. Now, I'm not normally given to rattling on about box art or anything like that, but you know, this is cool because it just gives you kind of a of an overall high quality feel, um, which is nice. And, uh, you know, it gives you a little bit of an idea of what is gonna be inside. Um, as far as the box art goes, this is a, uh, a copy of the original painting by Derek Stinning. So you, you right there, you get a pretty good idea of what is the, I don't know, re recommended color scheme if you're gonna try and be true to the original artwork. So anyway, then inside the box is uh, nothing. <laughs> It's in, well then look, you get a bonus dead moth. Uh, actually, no, it, it does not come with nothing in it. It's just that I've been working on this for a while, so I'm gonna show you stuff already out of the box. But what this is, is the base uh, that you get uh, for the, for, um, well, if I can get it out of there, for mounting the Cosmonaut. So that's pretty cool, etched plexiglass. Uh, then you can see there you get a little decal sheet and you get some very nice stiff wires which will be required for the floating orbs that go uh, behind the, uh, the cosmonaut. So uh, let's take a look at what actually did come inside the box. Uh, you get this sort of instruction sheet and that's it on the back. That's what you get. Those are the instructions. <laughs> but you don't really need much more than that. It is a very simple kit as has been my experience with uh, other resin kits, although I've only built a couple of them. Um, you know, you don't really need a whole lot of, of in, the, in the way of instructions. Everything can pretty much only go together one, one way and um, it's not too hard to figure out what that is. So, there you go. And you can see what I meant about the floating orbs. Um, those are supposed to be basically suspended in midair. The smaller one is down here behind her. Uh, so, that's what the wires are for. Now, uh, let's look at some of the parts. I've already got uh, all of them out of the box and sort it out. So let's zoom in here a little bit so we can take a look at what we've actually got. Speaking of the orbs, this is the larger one and that immediately gives you a pretty good idea of the quality of the, the castings with these resin parts. Uh, it's really nice, super good stuff. This is the, this is the helmet. See, you've got a little bit of a pore stub on the top there that you got to deal with, but that's not too bad. But you can see really nice detail even inside the helmet. Uh, this is the uh, collar for the helmet. Again, you can see really nice detail inside and out. Um, this is the attachment ring for the helmet. Pretty cool. And then the, uh, the bag that goes on the front of the cosmonaut's chest. Even Derek Stinning says he doesn't really know what this is for. Maybe it's a breathing apparatus. Who knows? Uh, he's, you know, in typical artist fashion, not really trying to, to get too specific with that. But then here's the one that goes on the back with its molded in detail you can see pretty cool right there good stuff 
And then you've got some small parts. Uh, these are the little microphones that go around each side of the uh, cosmonaut's head, which I'll show you here in a second. And then you get this uh, clear part for the helmet visor, which I probably will not use. I, I, it's you know it's kind of thick and a little bit wavy. So I'm gonna replace it with a piece of acetate for maximum clarity. Now, you're like, well, wait a minute, that's not very much. What about arms and legs and a head and all that? Well, like I said, I've been working on the Cosmonaut quite a bit, actually, and uh, done a lot of painting. And so here is the head, which you can see. Uh, I've, I've almost completed painting it. It's had pretty much everything done to it that's going to get done except the uh, little snaps here on either side of the chin strap need to be painted silver, but you can see really, really good detail that's uh, molded into that thing. But anyway, that kind of almost gets into the results, and so we'll talk more about that uh, later. The other part uh, is, I'm gonna zoom out here, you gotta pardon my mess. I got a nice shipment over here from uh, the fine folks, Paul Bretland and his wife, Hannah, and their young son, James, at Ultimate Modeling Products. I got a whole set of the new Suji Burrito files that I'm super excited about. But anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. This is, this is the Cosmonauts body. You can see um, here. Maybe I can get a better angle if I just move the camera. We'll try it this way. There we go. There she is. All right, there we go. Hopefully you can sort that out from all the background noise. Anyway, you can see that I've been doing some painting. I've uh, put down the uh, green color for the outside of her suit and done a lot of airbrush blending uh, for the highlights and the shadows and then painted the uh, the the uh, two parts up there at the top that go underneath the uh, well underneath the bladders and the collar so again you can see the detail this is where most of the assembly work uh, has taken place so far she comes with only a torso two arms uh, and the and the legs and the joint is actually right in here someplace um, and I have to say I, I have been really impressed with the fit of the parts um, y y they just I just really tight everything has been really tight uh, I used uh, uh, some filler obviously to smooth over the joint where the legs attach um, but it I mean, it was the difference between having it be perfectly smooth and just having a, a tight little line there, to be honest. Uh, I've seen people put it together without filling that line in, and it doesn't look horrible, but obviously I wasn't going to just leave that there. Um, so the bodywork there wasn't too bad. I did that uh, mostly with Mr. Surfacer 500 and uh, plenty of Mr. Surfacer 1500 primer. The, uh, the way the arms go on is pretty simple. They fit uh, into the shoulder right in between the two uh, sort of pivot points right here on this black thing. And again, it went together really easily and without a lot of fuss. I, I, used, I used some Mr. Surfacer 500 to uh, just basically make sure that the, there weren't any little gaps left over. But it was really good. I mean, look, overall, this, the quality of this thing has just been outstanding. There's a couple of places where the uh, 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 build lines from the 3D printing, when they did the master patterns, show up a little bit, but not a big deal, nothing offensive. A couple of really small casting flaws. There was one right here that, that, that I removed easily. Um, but, but really, there wasn't much to interrupt the fun at all. Um, I would say the most challenging part of the assembly is that most of these loops are separate pieces and you can see the ones that have a hole in them there where the uh, cables pass through 
Hopefully the camera will focus on that with all that stuff in the background. Um, anyway, those are those are a little bit tedious. Um, each one of them only goes in one spot for the most part. Um, but I guess if I had one complaint to register about the kit, it would be that um, the numbering that's molded in to each of, of these little pieces is pretty hard to read on some of them. Um, they come on a little sprue like this that you clip them off of. And um, in each of the notches that they go into is the corresponding number. And it's real easy to read. So I don't know. I guess if that's one small thing that maybe uh, um, the guys at Industria Mechanica could improve on. Um, uh, it, it would be that. But overall, just a super easy and fun to build thing. Um, uh, I, <laughs> maybe even too much fun. <laughs> I actually feel a little creepy uh, working on this so much because, well, look, let's face it, dudes. Uh, she is smoking hot. <laughs> I actually was chatting with uh, Michael Fichtenmeyer, uh, who's the uh, owner and operator of uh, Industria Mechanica, and uh, I asked him if, <laughs> if she was a real girl or if she was all digital, and um, uh, uh, unfortunately she is 100% digital, so I guess my marriage plans are thwarted, but yeah, you can see she looks pretty good, and um, hey, it is what it is, right? So, with that, let's uh, skip now uh, forward uh, what will probably be a couple of weeks from right now and see what I actually managed to accomplish when I finish this thing out. Okay, so there you go. That's that's what she looks like, all finished up. Ah, but I've got uh, I've got her here on the bench, and uh, I just want to give, as usual, a little bit of uh, a little bit of a rundown about how I did what I did and what I think about about the kit overall. Uh, this thing for me really was a. Uh, a real exploration of of technique and uh, of trying to expand my skills and and my understanding in particular of how to paint figures and and do uh, and do a lot of that work with oils. I do not consider myself to be a figure painter. I feel like I'm not very good at it, um, but it's something that I want to get better at. 
And I've wanted to do one of these ever since I learned about uh, Industria Mechanica, but didn't feel like I had anywhere close to the skills to uh, justify uh, trying it, especially not uh, given that this is about 150 bucks for one of these kits. Um, so I've been gradually working my way up through 148th, 135th, 132nd, <laughs> 120th scale figures to try and, and at least develop some basic skills. And as you guys know, there's a bunch of different schools of thought about how to paint figures. What I've kind of settled on is what works for me that just seems most intuitive is that I do an acrylic base um, for for each color. So I, I block in all of the basic colors, the black, the greens, etc. And then um, I do uh, almost all, if not all, of the shading with oils. And that's pretty much what I did here. Although, because of the size of this, I also used a, a slightly different approach um, that I have, have seen some pretty good figure painters do. And that is that um, I established the basic shading on, uh, on, on the greens and the blacks by, uh, with an airbrush, where I, uh, I did everything. I blocked in the basic color. Uh, let's call those the midtones. And uh, then I came in from below with a darker version of the midtone and sprayed basically at the bottom of each of these, uh, of the entire thing to pick up the bottoms of the wrinkles. Then I came back with a lighter version of the midtone and sprayed from above to basically create highlights in the same way. So that kind of gave me a roadmap for the for the shading and the highlights and the and the shadows, and then I was able to then come in uh, later on and refine those uh, with oils. Um, and and I don't really know how much more to say about the basic process than that. I, I like I said I don't consider myself to be a good figure painter, and I don't really feel like I know enough of what I'm doing to be telling anybody else how they should do it for sure. But that is the basic methodology that I used. Um, if you're curious about specific things, I use Windsor & Newton oils because they seem to be really good quality and lots of people recommend those. Um, but beyond that, I just basically, uh, you know, when I do something like this, I'm just working my way through it kind of as I go and hoping for the best. Anyway, um, that's pretty much all there is to say about the painting. Um, I, um, I don't, uh, oh gosh, I don't really know how much more to say. This, in some ways, this paint, paint work was both more simple and more complex than stuff that I've done before. Um, I don't really know how to explain that, but I think you can kind of see what I mean. Uh, the colors are simple, but the shading and the nuances are more complex. Um, I did do some chipping. You can see here on the helmet. I mean, I love me some chipping. Can't uh, can't can't let a model go without a little bit of that at least. So I did some chipping there to kind of show that that helmet's been beaten up and tossed around. And then this floating orb, whatever it is and whatever it does, I also did some two-tone chipping on it to give it a little bit of, of variation. Um, you can kind of see what's going on there. Um, I guess maybe uh, one, more, one thing that's good to talk about is the base, because obviously I did not use the base that came in the kit. Um, I just didn't feel like it was really substantial enough. I wanted something that I knew would be really stable. And Bill West, one of our good contributors in Scale Modeler's Critique Group, turned me on to these things from uh, Blick Art Supply. These are basically little wooden panels. They've got a wooden frame that runs all the way around them. And then this, uh, this uh, piece here is, uh, I think, quarter-inch plywood. So what I did to sort of create this look of a, of a shiny white floor is I put down some pieces of 20,000 thick evergreen sheet styrene. And uh, then I painted it all with Tamiya Flat White. 
and then put a pretty hefty layer of 2K clear urethane gloss on it and polished it out. So hopefully you can see that there's some uh, that there's some reflectivity there. It's kind of hard to see with it being white, but it is pretty slick and pretty shiny, and that was just kind of a good polishing exercise. Um, and I like it. It's pretty stable. I, I've got a piece of brass tubing uh, coming up through it and into her lower leg to make sure that she's uh, nice and stable. This figure will stand on its own, um, but barely. I mean, you know, she's pretty tall and pretty top-heavy, so I definitely wasn't going to take any chances on that. Now, um, uh, I guess I should talk about these floating balls because they are such a key element with this project and they they were the thing that I was dreading the most um, <laughs> because uh, I knew that it was just going to be a challenge to get all of this wire shaped. You do get the wire in the kit and um, for this thick wire that's supposed to be I guess an air hose for this largest orb I used the wire in the kit and then for the smaller orbs main wire this one here that holds it up I also use the wire from the kit but for these smaller wires I just use lead wire because that 15 thousandths lead wire uh, just drapes so nicely and is so much easier to work with um, the wire that comes in the kit is steel wire and it's relatively malleable but it's still not as easy to, to work with when you're trying to thread it through these uh, what are supposed to be cloth loops like here on her sleeve so um, and, and, I, and, and I did have some issues even at that uh, in particular like this wire loop, piece of wire here um, basically I had to end it right here uh, in the middle of her leg and then finish the rest of it up to this breathing pack thing with lead wire because I just couldn't get the steel wire to thread all the way through each of those loops. So that's one tip if you are ever thinking about building this kit, even though each of these loops uh, that, that is supposed to have a wire going through it has a hole in it, I would recommend at a minimum that you make the hole a little bit larger, maybe even just uh, you know grind it out a little bit with a with a rotary tool. Um, it, it, it's one of those things where when you just take one of those little pieces and poke a piece of wire through it, you think you've got plenty of room and that the wire is going to slide through it pretty easily. But when it comes time to actually get it to follow the profile of her leg or, or her arm or whatever, <laughs> things get a little bit more difficult. Especially if, as in well, one case, you leave a little glob of super glue inside there and then you have to deal with that later. Uh, so anyway, just a little bit of a tip on the wire. Um, the, um, this, this main wire here, what I did was I actually shaped it um, before I had the thing uh, completed. Where basically it was just, I had her, uh, you know, almost completely done. It was all painted, and I could, but, I, but I hadn't mounted it to the base yet, and I could lay it down and really work with it. And if you remember, I did a, a little video about having to fix a chip in the paint because while I was shaping this wire, I knocked a chunk of paint out of her leg right here and I had to go back and repair that. Um, in retrospect, um, I don't know if I picked the right strategy. Basically, what I decided early on, and this is a good lesson in how early decisions can affect you way down the road, I decided that I, um, I knew that shaping the wire was going to be a hassle and that it would probably be better if you could do it with the entire thing assembled. But because of the way I chose to paint it uh, with my airbrush doing as much of the shading as possible, I didn't feel like I could do an effective job, especially where I had to create a color separation between the light green and the dark green in areas like this, I didn't feel like I could do a good job of that if the whole thing was put together. And so I elected to, um, as I showed in the, in, the, in the segment before the photographs, do all of the painting of her suit, um, the base painting anyway, with the airbrush, uh, before I attached the forearms and the legs, which is what would have enabled me to shape this wire. 
In retrospect, that might not have been the smartest thing to do. I might have been just as effective if I had built the entire thing and shaped the wire and taken it back off and then done all of the painting that way. And honestly, I probably could have brush painted this entire thing. I don't know in retrospect that I really bought myself anything uh, by doing it the way that I did it in terms of making it easier to paint. It was still a lot of work uh, to paint and a lot of layers, and it actually might have been less work the other way. I don't know. We'll see when I do uh, Cosmonaut number three if I, if I choose to tackle it the same way. But anyway, what that decision meant was that I didn't have any choice but to work at shaping this wire um, after the basic painting was done. Um, but I did at least sort of save myself uh, by um, uh, not doing the final oil paint shading and, and final flat coat and everything before I, did, before I did that. I hope that's all making sense. To just reiterate and try to make it a little bit more clear, I did all of the base colors with my airbrush. Highlights and then low lights. I did a, a good solid clear coat of aqua gloss to make sure everything was protected. Then I uh, attached the arms and the, the legs. Uh, then I came back and I shaped that main wire and then set it aside. Then I came back and did all of my oil paint shading to deepen the shadows and lighten the highlights. Then came back with another layer of aqua gloss and then a final flat coat on everything. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the basic process. Anyway, um, the, the last thing that I did with this wire before I installed it was I got myself some 1 16th inch heat shrink tubing from uh, Amazon and uh, I was able to slide it over the entire thing, although I had to split it and slide half of it from this end and half of it from the other end. Um, but I feel like that was one of the smartest things that I did because not only did that mean that I didn't have to paint that entire wire and deal with, you know, touching up all of the inevitable places where the paint would chip off of it, but uh, it gave it a little bit of a rubbery uh, uh texture to it so that it looks more like an air hose and it wasn't as scratchy and I didn't have to worry about it damaging the paint while I was wrestling around with getting it in place here. So anyway, I feel like the heat shrink tubing was uh, definitely the right way to go. Now, what I would do differently if I were going to do this one again and then what I will probably do differently with the Cosmonaut number no. 3 is I will probably try and get some stiffer wire. Um, for both of these uh, orbs. Um, they seem like they're pretty stable while I'm just sitting here, you know, very carefully turning it around. <laughs> but as I found out when I took this over to, the, to my photo table to shoot pictures of it, it's an illusion. It took about uh, 10 feet of very carefully carrying this over <laughs> To where I was going to shoot pictures of it for this ball to basically just go and droop down to here and for this one to go off in a different direction. I mean, there were balls flying everywhere and yeah, we know that's never a good thing. Um, and then when I, after I got them sort of back in place and then I went to bring it back over here to my workbench to do this segment, same thing happened again and it was another disaster and I had to basically put them back in place. Um, the bottom line is that this sphere is solid resin and it's just too heavy uh, really for this wire. I mean, I, I, I don't have any confidence whatsoever that I'm gonna be able to move this thing to my desk without having another disaster of these balls falling all over the place, which I really don't like. I, I, it stresses me out. I like to build stuff really solid. I don't like things being janky. And it just it just bugs me that something is is going to be that fragile when it's all said and done. So I'm not real happy about that, but it kind of is what it is. And I kind of I guess I had to go through the experience to really, you know, see uh, just what a challenge that is. But you have to admit, it does look cool. Um, I really do feel like this pulls off the look of the floating orbs really effectively. But like I said, I mean, you can see. 
you know, that's <laughs> that's just not stable at all. And I'm not going to do that with the larger sphere because it'll end up somewhere it's not supposed to be. So, uh, again, if you are thinking about building one of these, I would consider getting some stiffer wire, and uh, which obviously will be harder to shape, but do it before you do any of the painting, which really kind of dictates assembling at least the forearms, or at least that left forearm, or right forearm, so I'm sorry, uh, before, you, before you do any painting. Now, speaking of assembling the forearms, uh, that kind of gets into one of the areas where I had some trouble with the, uh, with the kit. Um, as I said in the segment before the photographs, the thing really is pretty high quality. Um, I don't have a ton of experience with resin. I mean, this is only my second one. My Stan robot kit is the only other resin kit that I've done. And I felt like that thing was really well engineered and the fit was really good. And other than, um, you know, just kind of a fragile assembly with the way his legs went on, he was pretty structurally sound. I feel like this kit was maybe just a little less well engineered. And, uh, and, and here's why. Um, it really does duplicate the look of the painting really well, but there's one area right here where I, I felt like it just needed a little bit more massaging. I had a ton of trouble with the positioning of this arm here. And I didn't really discover that until I already had, had it on and I started shaping this wire. And I have seen this in pictures of other people's projects uh, on the internet. What ends up happening, if you're not careful, is the inside of the hand here will end up almost touching the outside of her thigh, which, as you can imagine, leaves you basically no room for that uh, cable to snake through there. And so I ended up having to do a lot of work to massage the fit of that forearm where it attaches right here to create enough room right there for that cable to come through there the way it's supposed to. It was a real hassle. Was not happy. On the other side, there was also a little bit of an issue. Um, you can see, if you look closely, there's a little bit of a gap between the uh, inside of that forearm and her hip. Um, that is because I had to remove quite a bit of material from the inside of that forearm to even get it to fit there in the first place. And I don't really know what I could have done differently because the way that the arms attach here in the shoulders, I mean, they're it's kind of a kind of a, of a one-way deal. I mean, they they pop in there, and there's not a whole lot of ambiguity about it. So I'm not really sure what I could have done differently. But again, that leads me back to thinking that maybe the better solution would have been to build the whole thing before I did any painting. Because <laughs> dealing with these fit issues after I had all the green and black paint on there was really a bad situation. But it was nothing compared to the challenges that I had with the helmet. Now, this helmet, uh, holy shit, what a, what, <laughs> this is the place where if I were going to say there's anything on this kit that causes it to fall down a bit and not be an overall great kit, it's with the engineering of this helmet because there basically is none. Um, it, it just, and it's a little bit baffling because I feel like that given how beautifully molded the head is and given the effort that just about anybody is going to go to in painting the head, that you would recognize that someone might at least want to have the option of removing the helmet. And I did, in fact, give myself that option. I'm not going to take it off. You're just going to take my word for it. Um, the helmet is basically just... I mean, it's just barely sitting on here. And the reason is because there's just nothing that really engages it. Um, I had a lot of trouble getting it to fit on the collar of this, what I guess is supposed to be like a flexible ceiling kind of boot thing here. Um, I had a lot of trouble getting it to fit correctly between this part of the helmet and the top of this of that boot thing to begin with. But even once you do get it to fit, there really isn't much engagement. I mean, there's just nothing that really 
keeps that helmet sitting firmly in place, as you can see. I mean, it's just kind of precariously balanced on there. And there's just not a whole lot you can do about that if you don't want to glue it on. And of course, if you do glue it on, you're not going to ever see any of the work that you did to paint the head again. And, you know, what the hell, I guess I should just pop it off here because it's so easy to do. Uh, and I really need to, to talk about another one of the issues with this. You may be able to see pretty easily that there's not a lot of clearance. Um, because of the way her head is tilted forward, there is barely any room, and there's really not enough room, between her nose and these microphone pieces and the inside of the helmet. And I actually even left a piece out of the helmet. There's uh, a little thing here. Let's see. I've still got it. Um, it's this. Uh, it's this thing. It's kind of a. Uh, it's kind of like a little, like, I don't know, like a liner or what? Well, I don't know what it is, but it allegedly, according to the instructions, is supposed to fit on the inside of the opening of the uh, of the glass right there. And not only does it not even come close to fitting in there correctly, um, but if I had put it on there, there definitely would be no way for the front part of the helmet here to clear her uh, the front part of her face. Um, it just wouldn't have worked. And so I, I, uh, I chose to leave that off. Um, so I really think that if there was ever going to be another version of this kit or another release of it, that some engineering work there would definitely uh, would definitely be in order. I'm not exactly sure what the right solution is. I mean, you can see it's really kind of an organic shape. If the camera will will decide to focus there, it's really uh, a, a come on camera. Wow, it just really does not want to play, does it? Here, we'll zoom in. Maybe that'll help. Come on, camera. Come on. There we go. You can see that it really is an organic shape. And maybe the answer is to just make it perfectly circular and planar. I, I don't know. I mean, there's some different ways to go about it, but you can see that it is a challenge. Now, what I tried to do to make the helmet where it would stay on there better is I added some tabs here with holes in them, and I... And I Create. I drilled through the collar of the helmet, and I created, you know, what I thought would be kind of a neat-looking uh, pin with a cable retainer on it. You can see there, um, and so that I don't lose the pins, and it kind of works. But what I found out pretty quickly is that nothing fits positively enough for these pins to be easy to get back through the little holes. So I just kind of gave up on that and I've basically just been balancing the helmet there and hoping for the best. Now another thing that I did to kind of make things a little bit easier is I allowed a little bit of movement in the head because I've got it mounted with a magnet. Um, you can see if I can just pop it off of there. This will probably be a disaster. There you go. There's a pretty strong magnet from a Tamiya kit right there in the neck, and there's another one in the bottom of, of, of the head. And so that sticks the head on there pretty confidently, but it allows it to wiggle just enough that when I put the helmet on, if it needs to shift a little bit in order for the helmet to, to go, it'll do it. So anyway, that's kind of how I worked my way around all of that stuff. Another place where I guess uh, I, I would say, since I'm kind of nitpicking here, is the molding on these numbers was really nice on the back. You can see here um, where they are and how they're, they stick out. And that made painting them a, a lot easier than it otherwise would have been. But on the front, it was very difficult uh, because they were not nearly as as crisply molded. And the one in particular, I had to scribe around it to, uh, to get any kind of definition there to help me uh, be able to color inside the lines. So that is a little bit of a quality thing there. But 
overall, you know, not not a, not that wasn't that wasn't a, a really a big deal. Um, I guess that's really about all I can say at this point about it. Um, I I uh, you know you can kind of see for yourself what the results are. One thing that I definitely learned about this is that even though there are a lot of things that are a lot easier at such a huge scale, like the eyes, for example. Um, I ended up using some decals from Archer for the eyeballs, and I think they turned out pretty good. I learned later that the Archer eyeball decals are not necessarily the best ones. Come on, surely we can focus on that. The Archer eyeball decals aren't necessarily the best ones, but, you know, you live and learn. But that's the kind of thing where happening at such a large scale makes it a lot easier. But, in a way, it's less forgiving because every little goober shows up. And I'm sure you can see in the photos that there are plenty of goobers. I mean, it's just unforgiving. You just don't have a lot of room for mistakes on color separations and things like that. So... Uh, definitely, you know, it definitely will tax your skills in a unique way compared to doing a 135th scale figure. Um, and it's definitely totally different from, you know, certainly from armor or aircraft or anything else I've done. So, uh, you know, lots to learn. Cool experience. I'm not sure I'd call it fun, but it's not going to keep me from doing another one either. Okay, so there you go. As usual, a lot of yapping about something that seems relatively simple, but that's how these projects go. They kind of take on a life of their own. I did uh, misspeak there at the beginning, though. I said that it was a one eighth scale or one sixth scale kit, and it's not. It's one eighth scale, so just a little bit smaller than that. But um, overall, I think it was a pretty cool project. Um, I'm, uh, I guess I'm, I'm pleased with the way it turned out. I definitely learned a lot. And uh, if you're looking for something to challenge your figure painting skills or just get you out of your comfort zone and do something completely different, I would, I would totally recommend getting yourself over to industriamechanica.com. Uh, that's Mechanica spelled with a K at the end. Um, and check out their stuff. Uh, Michael Fichtenmeyer's got a really cool little company, and he's offering stuff that you just won't find anywhere else in the model, uh, in the model kit market. So check it out. And as always, if you put up with my uh, long rambling explanation of what I did and what I thought, I absolutely appreciate it. Take care. Much love.